welcome to this segment on connective tissue disorders. In our previous discussions on myopathies, we identified a number of genetic diseases that had effects on muscle form and function. We will now consider a different set of genetic mutations which will affect connective tissues. As with muscle tissue, we can predict, to a certain degree, the specific effects based on our understanding of the physiology of connective tissue. For example, in our discussion of bone tissue, we learned that the bone matrix is composed of equal parts organic and inorganic material. We also learned that the organic material gave bone its flexibility and the inorganic material its rigidity. We can therefore predict the consequences of gene mutations that affect either organic or inorganic matrix. Although a number of connective tissue disorders have been identified, for this session we will focus on four of the most common families of disorders observed in the clinical setting. We will discuss how the gene mutation results in the pathophysiology for the disease and treatment options that may be available to the patient. The first condition we will look at is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This is not related to a single type of gene mutation or even a series of mutations to a single gene. This is actually a large group of disorders where one or more of the different forms of collagen is mutated. Identification and classification of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome has evolved and continues to evolve as more variants of the disease are identified. The original classification system included 10 specific types. In 1997, revisions to the classification system saw a reduction to six categories, with each containing specific titles. In 2017, the system was overhauled once again, this time being increased to 13 subtypes. This included a number of conditions that were either not discovered or not recognized as being related to Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Although the traditional definition of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome was restricted to gene mutations in collagen proteins themselves, in the new characterization system, some additional gene mutations, typically involved in collagen synthesis, have also been identified. Under the current classification system, the most common form of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is hypermobile EDS, which was formally classified as type 3 EDS. The main feature of this condition is joint laxity throughout the body. This leads to chronic muscle and bone pain and makes the individual susceptible to frequent joint subluxation or dislocations. Skin manifestations are typically minimal in this group, with the most common sign being remarkably smooth, soft skin and a tendency to bruise easily. The condition is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, but the specific gene or more likely various genes involved in the condition are not yet known. Diagnosis is therefore based on clinical evaluation of the physical presentation. A slightly less common form of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is classical EDS, identified as type 1 EDS in the previous classification system. The presentation pattern is similar to that seen for hypermobile EDS, but there is greater involvement of the skin. In classical EDS, the skin appears hypermobile, and can be stretched and distended when pulled upon. Once again, patients tend to bruise easily with this form of EDS. Three genes found to be associated with classical EDS are COL5A1 and COL5A2, which code for the alpha-1 and 2 chains in type 5 collagen, and COL1A1. Symptoms vary from patient to patient, and the condition likely goes undiagnosed if the presentation pattern is mild. In addition to the two most common forms of EDS, another 11 subtypes are also presently identified, including vascular EDS and kyphoscoliosis EDS. It is likely that the classification system will continue to adapt as more variants are discovered and more genetic causes are identified. The complexity of the condition is likely in part due to the complexity in collagen synthesis. As you've learned in biochemistry, there are multiple collagen isoforms that go through extensive post-translational modifications before being secreted into the extracellular matrix. Mutations to the collagen proteins themselves, or to any of the enzymes involved in collagen synthesis, would theoretically result in some form of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. As discussed in our connective tissue session, collagen is the principal protein responsible for tensile strength in these tissues. The result of these mutations is deficiency in 
or decreased quality of the secreted collagen, which leads to a decrease in tensile strength and greater distensibility of the connective tissue. The diversity seen in the different subtypes of EDS is likely due to the fact that different tissues will express collagen isoforms in different concentrations. Mutations to a specific isoform or to the enzymes involved in the processing of the isoform are likely to have a more dramatic impact on tissues in which the isoform is expressed in greater concentrations. Patient presentation is important in reaching a diagnosis, especially in the majority of situations where a genetic mutation has not been specifically identified. The most common symptoms include increased skin elasticity and joint hypermobility. Patients with a suspected EDS condition should be assessed for other symptoms, such as aneurysm and abnormal spine curvatures, which may provide additional clues to the specific isoform but will also help in identifying potentially serious health issues early on in the pathological process. Currently, there is no cure for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and treatment is focused upon minimizing symptoms related to the disease. Stretching exercises are discouraged in this population, as they could increase the patient's susceptibility to joint dislocation. A closely monitored resistance training program could lead to increased joint stability from greater muscle tone across the joint space. If additional tissues are affected, other precautions should be put in place. In the case of vascular involvement, for example, contact sports should be discouraged as blunt force trauma could result in vascular damage and internal bleeding. The next condition we are going to look at is called osteogenesis imperfecta, a term which literally means faulty bone development, which is a good descriptor for this condition. The condition also goes by the name brittle bone disease which again gives an accurate description of the clinical presentation. If you're a fan of the M. Night Shyamalan movie series, you may recognize this as the very real condition that the fictitious character, Mr. Glass, suffers from. The condition results from one of a number of specific mutations to the type 1 collagen protein. This collagen isoform is expressed abundantly in bone and ligament, as well as in teeth and the sclera of the eye. As we noted with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, the tissues with the greatest abundance of the affected protein will also show the greatest degree of pathology, which is also the case here. The mutation to collagen greatly affects the tensile strength of bone, which is easily susceptible to fracture, even under normal physiological stresses. Fractures have been reported in newborns having occurred in utero. The condition is typically recognized with unusual fractures occurring in neonates which are often initially interpreted as signs of child abuse. Patients would also experience joint laxity due to the effect of the disease on ligaments, but this finding is not of as great a clinical importance. Patients will also typically present with some degree of tooth malformation and a blue tinge to the sclera of the eye due to thinning of the connective tissue layer and an increased translucency. Osteogenesis imperfecta is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. As a quick review of collagen biochemistry, the structure of this helical protein is dependent on a repeating tripeptide motif, where glycine is found in every third position. The other positions contain high quantities of amino acids such as proline, which contain bulky and rigid side chains. The presence of the smaller glycine amino acid allows for sharp curves within the peptide chain to maintain the integrity of the collagen helix. A mutation to one of these glycine residues, particularly if an amino acid with a bulkier side chain is inserted, could have devastating effects on the overall geometry of the collagen fiber, resulting in the decreased tensile strength seen with osteogenesis imperfecta. Although a variety of gene mutations can affect the collagen 1 protein and lead to osteogenesis imperfecta, these mutations can be generally characterized into a more and a less severe form, depending on if the condition results from a missense or a nonsense mutation. Unlike what we saw with Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, however, the missense mutation typically results in the more severe form of osteogenesis imperfecta. A nonsense mutation to the collagen 1 protein results in what is referred to as a quantitative form of osteogenesis imperfecta. The name reflects the fact that while all of the type 1 collagen that is produced is normal in structure, the mutation results in an overall low quantity of protein due to the presence of only a single working gene copy.
This means that all the protein expressed within a given tissue will have a normal structure but express a lower concentration, which results in a slightly diminished tensile strength. Patients will typically present with diminished bone density and porous bone can be seen in histological analysis. In the case of a missense mutation, normal or near normal quantities of type 1 collagen are produced, but roughly half of the generated protein strands contain structural abnormalities. This is therefore referred to as a qualitative form of the disease. In this situation, the collagen fiber is structurally weakened due to the conformational protein change that results from the gene mutation. This results in a more severe presentation pattern with the severity dependent on the precise mutation and the degree to which it alters the protein structure. Characteristics include a decrease in the level of osteon formation and greater levels of primary or woven bone, as well as structural abnormalities at the epithelial growth plate. A total of seven separate subtypes of osteogenesis imperfecta have been identified based on the severity of the presentation pattern and the tissues affected. The initial presentation is usually related to frequent and unexplained fractures in the patient. Currently, there is no cure for osteogenesis imperfecta. The condition typically presents at an early age, and early treatment involves education for the parents of the affected child to help minimize trauma that could result in additional fractures. An OT assessment of the living environment could identify possible dangers, such as fall risks and hard surfaces. Certain medications may also help to improve bone health. Bisphosphonates, such as pamidronate, serve to inhibit osteoclast activity, while growth hormone can further stimulate osteoblast activity to increase bone density. Orthopedic interventions can also be used to assist with bone deformation. The insertion of an intramedullary rod into the femur can minimize varus deformations. The next condition to consider is Marfan syndrome. Again, this includes a range of disorders that specifically involve mutation to the FBN1 gene, which codes for the fibrillin 1 protein. About 1 in 5,000 children are born with Marfan syndrome, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Three quarters of the cases involve inheritance from an affected parent, with the remaining cases being the result of de novo mutations. Prominent individuals affected with Marfan syndrome include American President Abraham Lincoln and Peter Mayhew, the actor who portrayed Chewbacca throughout the run of the Star Wars franchise. Marfan syndrome occurs with any one of a number of mutations to the fibrillin protein. Many of these mutations involve substitution of a cysteine residue that is important to proper folding of the glycoprotein, similar to the effects of a glycine substitution in osteogenesis imperfecta. Fibrillin is a glycoprotein that plays a critical role in formation and maintenance of the extracellular matrix, particularly with the organization of elastin fibers. Deficiencies in the fibrillin protein are thought to compromise connective tissue integrity, resulting in damage to elastin fibers. It has also been shown that fibrillin has an effect in sequestering transforming growth factor beta. Loss of fibrillin has been shown to activate transforming growth factor beta, resulting in the release of proteases and inflammatory response in the tissue. Although this is thought to have an effect in the pathophysiology of the disease, further work on the specific role that TGF beta plays still needs to be done. Loss of elasticity leads to excessive stretching in connective tissues where elastin is typically expressed in high quantities. Musculoskeletal deformities include abnormally long and thin limbs and digits, a pigeon-chested appearance, joint laxity, flat feet, scoliosis, and knock knees. Numerous cardiovascular effects have also been noted due to the expression of elastin fibrils in vascular connective tissue. This may lead to valvular prolapse and an increased risk of arterial aneurysm and aortic dissection. The condition also has an effect on the eyes and can lead to lens dislocation and myopia due to the effects on the ciliary muscles. As with other conditions, there is no cure for Marfan syndrome. The main complication is related to cardiovascular problems, so these patients are monitored for potential heart and vascular defects. 
Surgical intervention is indicated when serious problems are identified. Management of these cardiovascular conditions can lead to an essentially normal lifespan in these individuals. Women with Marfan syndrome should be closely monitored during pregnancy and delivery, as the syndrome puts them at an increased risk of fatal aortic dissection during childbirth. The last disorder which we will look at is achondroplasia, which results in the most common form of dwarfism. This tends to affect one in every 26,000 to 40,000 live births. The condition has its most dramatic effects on the appendicular skeleton. This results in normal to relatively normal axial body dimensions with shortened limbs. Patients will also typically experience diminished range of motion at certain joints, with the elbow being affected in particular, as well as lower limb deformities resulted in bow leggingness. At adulthood, the average male height is 4 feet 4 inches, and the average female height is 4 feet 1 inches. Achondroplasia presents in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Only about a fifth of cases are inherited from an affected parent, with the remaining cases resulting from de novo mutation. The mutation involves the FGFR3 gene, which codes for a fibroblast growth factor receptor. The most common form of the mutation appears to be an alanine to lysine amino acid substitution that results in an overactive form of the receptor. Chronic FGF receptor activity has a negative effect on chondroblast proliferation within the epithelial growth plate. Thinking back to our discussion of bone growth, chondroblast proliferation is of critical importance in zone 2, the zone of proliferation in the growth plate. This ensures the continued growth of the epithelial plate towards the epiphysis. In individuals with the receptor mutation, this slows proliferation. As a result, the osteoclasts catch up to the leading front of the epithelial growth plate much earlier on in adolescence, resulting in premature fusion of the growth plate and stunted growth. Because the effect is specific to chondroblasts, endochondral ossification but not intramembranous ossification is affected. As a result, patients with this condition have stunted growth in the long bones making up the appendicular skeleton, but typically have normal size heads. As with the other conditions we have talked about, there is presently no cure for achondroplasia. Certain medications, such as somatotrophin, can promote osteoblast division, promoting growth in affected individuals. The effects of the medication work best if introduced within the first six years of life, with most gains being observed in the first year of use. Patients should be referred for occupational therapy to assist with modifications to the living environment to promote independence and improve quality of life. That concludes the segment on connective tissue disorders. In the next segment, we will hear from a young lady who is currently being investigated for a connective tissue disorder and her personal experiences leading up to this point.